Leo Panich, uh, and I want to welcome you here this evening uh, on behalf of the Socialist Register uh, and the Socialist Project uh, and the Center for Social Justice, all of which are sponsoring uh, this public uh, event. Uh, it's taking place in the context of a workshop that uh, we've organized for the uh, contributors to the next Socialist Register, the 2011 Socialist Register, which will be on the theme of the crisis, the crisis. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate to have here in Toronto a remarkable group of people from all over the world. Uh, and uh, we thought uh, we shouldn't be selfish and should share some of them at least with the Toronto left. Uh, so we put together this panel this evening uh, called China, Japan, and the U.S. Together in Crisis? Uh, and we have uh, Taggart Murphy, R. Taggart Murphy, who's come all the way from Japan, where he teaches uh, at the University of Tsukuba. Uh, uh, Tag is uh, widely, internationally respected as perhaps the greatest authority on Japanese political economy. Uh, his books, The Japan's Policy Trap, uh, The Weight of the Yen, uh, his editorship of Japan Focus, uh, have all made him uh, uh, well known around the world for this. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased he's agreed to come and also take part in, in, in the volume. Um, thank you, Leo, for that very kind introduction. It's too kind. Um, the, uh, it, I think it makes sense for me to start because um, when we look at the question of it's kind of say the survival of global capitalism, but certainly the survival of American financial hegemony. Um, I think we have to go back to the 1970s and what was going on in Japan at that time. So for that reason, it probably makes uh, sense for me to <coughs> kick things off this evening, particularly because I'll be talking about the way in the last few years China has um, uh, taken over from Japan, or is in the process perhaps of taking over from Japan, um, the role of the uh, principal external sustainer of American financial hegemony, which itself is a puzzle, but I'm sure Professor uh, Hung will, will uh, illuminate us, um, illuminate us for us um, this evening. I, I, wanted, I, I say that I start with the 1970s, late 1960s and the, in the early 1970s, because what you saw at that time was the emergence of, if you want to put it this way, three conflicts um, that became, or three contradictions, I should say, that became inescapable for the Japanese political elite at that time. Um, the first of these was trade conflict um, with the United States. Um, the second was the monetary effects of Japan's economic strategy until that point. Um, Japan had launched an economic strategy in the 1950s, which was predicated around dollar accumulation, the accumulation of the international reserve currency um, of the time, or of our time. Um, and th that was beginning to have a deleterious monetary effects, um, that something had to be done about that from a policy perspective. And finally, Japan's, uh, the way that Japan was conducting its economy was changing the economic um, ecology in which it had flourished. Uh, between 1955 and 1968, um, the so-called miracle high growth years of Japan, Japan had been able to take as a given a limitless American market into which it could um, export its surplus production, and had been, a been able to take as a given a fixed exchange rate. Um, the emergence of Japanese trade surpluses in the uh, mid-1960s, the concomitant emergence of American trade deficits, put um, intolerable strains on the Bretton Woods, um, on the Bretton Woods system. Now, what happened at that time, uh, it, it, uh, the, what might have happened, or what, when some um, analysts or historians look at that period and say, why, isn't, why is it that Japan at that point did not overhaul its economy, change the structure of its economy, change the structure um, of its politics? And uh, the, the answer to that question, um, I think, goes back to um, the I mean, well, one has to go back almost to the Meiji period um, and the way in which the oligarchs who seized power um, in the mid-19th century um, established a governing um, elite with a fiction on the one hand of parliamentary government and a fiction on the other hand of um, direct imperial rule. In fact, the oligarchs ran things themselves. 
Um, when they died off, they left a vacuum at the center of the Japanese polity, um, a vacuum that was filled temporarily by mid-ranking officers in the um, Imperial Army who took Japan on a course for disaster. Um, that lack of what um, uh, you know, people like Maruyama Masao and Carl von Wolfert have called center of political responsibility, center of political accountability, was not, um, it was only um, uh, covered up, I, I suppose you could say, by the American occupation. Um, the United States proceeded to perform for Japan functions by which a state is commonly identified. The provision of um, economic security, I'm sorry, the provision of, of national security and the conduct of foreign relations. Japan was able to avoid having a fundamental political discussion um, uh, during those years because the United States played these, uh, these, these functions for Japan. Had Japan had an economic and political revolution, uh, or at least a different way of doing things, in, in, a, 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 a significant changeover in the early 1970s, those, those uh, questions would have come to the fore. And it was easier for the Japanese um, political elite, it was, almost, uh, it was almost a given that the Japanese political elite, instead of grappling with these fundamental questions, would, in, would attempt to recreate um, the certainties under which they had uh, over the previous 15 years generated what was until that point in history the <laughs> highest um, uh, the highest growth rates that had ever been seen in human history. Uh, between 1955 and 1969 um, the Japanese economy grew um, at a higher rates than, had ever, than any economy in history had, had, had ever grown. And the, uh, the, their first reaction to the emergence of these uh, contradictions was denial. Um, we don't want to hear about them. Um, uh, we will pay no attention to, we will simply um, do what we can to hang on to the fixed uh, 360 um, yen to the dollar rate. They were woken up by what in Japan is known as the Nixon shocks. That is the imposition of uh, surplus, uh, the imposition by the United States of tariffs on Japanese goods and the closing of the gold window um, that the United States, um, uh, the closing of the gold window that, that brought about the uh, the, the intention was to renegotiate the Bretton Woods system uh, to fix it, to, to, to move it to new rates. What the actual effect was, of course, um, was to spell the end of the system. Um, what Japan did then, as, as, as the decade proceeds, um, and as I say, this is, this is really the critical decade from several perspectives. Um, after the Bretton Woods system collapsed in 1973, and it collapsed partly because the Nixon administration was um, distracted by Watergate. Um, after the, um, this, the, the, the world's major powers had actually agreed to a uh, revaluation of the principal currencies um, uh, of the developed world countries um, at the Smithsonian Agreement in, in February of, of, two, of 1973, um, had the Nixon administration not been distracted by uh, Watergate, it's possible that they would have undertaken the disciplinary action necessary um, to keep the system of fixed rates uh, going. Um, but because they were partly, uh, because they were distracted, I mean, I, I mentioned this because at the time there was no one, you could find no uh, sec section of respectable economic opinion other than a handful of monitors at the University of Chicago who believed that a floating rate system um, could function and that a floating rate system would work. Um, what actually happened, though, as we know, was um, the world just simply abandoned the, uh, uh, the floating rate, the, the, the fixed rate system in, in 1973. Um, and uh, there was a period for a couple of years there, uh, 1974 and 1975, when it looked as if it was possible that the dollar's role as the uh, central, as the, the world's central monetary unit uh, would be overthrown. Um, there was consideration on the part of some of the Arab um, oil exporting countries, and you recall um, the, the uh, boycott of, of October of 1973, um, followed by the quadrupling of oil prices. Uh, there was consideration given to uh, billing their customers in currencies other than, than the U.S. dollar. Um, for various reasons, in particular, the military protection that the United States provided uh, for Saudi Arabia and for the Shah's Iran, um, and also because of the realization that there was no other currency that circulated outside, um, that circulated globally that would make it possible for their customers to pay their import bills, their oil import bills. Um, the world was, uh, continued to use the dollar. Japan played at this, at this point only a supporting role. 
Um, and the infrastructure, the, the, the development of the Eurodollar markets in, 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 in London made possible the first major um, recycling of surpluses um, outside the United States, dollar denominated surpluses outside the United States that were used to fund um, the, the uh, balance of payments loans that were taken down by a number of developing countries. In 1975 and 1976, however, Japan exported its way out of this um, global recession. Um, at a time when global growth was essentially nothing, Japan accounted for something like in the last quarter of 1975, first quarter of 1976, something more like 50% of the total global increase in exports. Now, this, um, this create, and they're, they're, very, they're fascinating parallels um, between what was happening in the mid-1970s with Japan's economic um, policies and what's going on in China today, and I think we'll, we'll probably hear about that um, more later this evening. But um, exporting your way in the teeth of the global recession, of course, and creates discontent, among other things, because people, uh, I mean, it, Japan found itself um, for a second time um, immersed in, in trade conflicts with, with, um, with the United States, but it also was provoking admiration. Here was a country, not only had it, um, had it managed, to, but it was recording higher growth rates than any other country um, in, the, uh, in the world, it was also, it had also brought inflation down um, in 1974 from 25% to 3% in the space of one year. Um, the significance globally um, was occurring in, in China, um, the following the death of Mao and the um, fall of the Gang of Four and the coming of Deng Xiaoping to power. Um, the Chinese uh, saw what Japan was doing, um, the famous visit that, uh, I don't know if it is that famous, but it should be famous, that Deng Xiaoping made um, to Japan in 1978. Um, and the adoption, the informal adoption of the uh, Japanese um, economic methods, um, the, the, which I define specifically as the uh, building of one's economy um, to generate um, an export-oriented export -oriented economy, specifically with the purpose of generating large um, levels of dollars. Now, um, in 1978, Japan participated in the secret four-country uh, four rescue of the dollar. Uh, the other participants were Saudi Arabia, Germany, and Switzerland. Um, these countries helped to intervene. The dollar was, was falling like a stone. Um, these countries intervened together, uh, agreed to intervene together in foreign exchange markets. It was part of a general uh, uh, pressure put on the Carter administration um, to do something um, about um, uh, the out-of-control inflation and the, the uh, drastically weakening dollar. We all know what happened, that um, Carter's hand was forced to appoint a hard money man um, as the, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Um, the whole business of Carter having his cabinet resign and so forth was a way of, because the president does not actually have the power to fire um, a president of the Federal Reserve. And the president of the Federal, the chairman of the Federal Reserve at that time, William Miller, had lost the confidence in the financial markets. Um, and uh, this was a, a, he had to ease uh, Miller out. Um, he brought in Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker then proceeds to, um, without any political obligation to the Carter administration, Volcker proceeds to raise interest rates to um, double digit levels. And this is where Japan begins to play the central starring role in the um, continued hegemony of the US dollar over global financial markets. And thus by extension um, the financial um, hegemony of the United States, um, certainly over global finance. Um, you recall Ronald Reagan is elected in 1980. Uh, Ronald Reagan begins to enact a, um, a series of tax cuts without concomitant spending reductions. Um, his Democratic opponents in the Congress politically think it's impossible to oppose these. Um, there is no respectable opinion anywhere that believes that these can be financed. Um, uh, you know, you have the supply side crazies who think that you can, you can cut taxes without cutting spending, and the result will simply be um, a greater economic growth, which will produce, um, the, will produce the, the revenues, but this was not believed by any, by any serious economist. Um, what happened instead, however, um, was that there was not the, uh, the United States did not hit the fiscal wall that um, was expected by such a wide spectrum of opinion. Tip O'Neill, who was then the uh, Democratic leader in the House, 
expected that the Reagan administration would have to come back to the Democratic Congress hat in hand and um, ask for such things as, as action on Social Security. Instead, these deficits were financed, and they were financed very easily, and they were financed almost entirely um, by the Japanese. Um, what was happening after, after 1979, um, the, the mini recession that was produced by the Iranian oil shock, the um, Japanese uh, savings rate continued to be very high, um, but uh, GNP never returned to the levels that it had been during the 1960s. The Japanese had an enormous amount of excess capital. The Ministry of Finance um, agreed to the uh, change in the, in the foreign exchange control law by which uh, the uh, Japanese banks and insurance companies no longer needed to apply to the Ministry of Finance for each of their um, investment decisions overseas. And it looked like, as far as the Japanese financial community was concerned, a no-brainer in the sense that the U.S. was offering double-digit interest rates um, and it, it was something like seven to eight percentage points higher than were available on comparable Japanese investments. Now, there was, of course, the risk of uh, the yen um, strengthening again. But the Japanese uh, investment community believed that th what had happened in the summer of 1978 demonstrated that the world's governments, particularly the United States, uh, Washington, and Tokyo, had the ability to control um, the yen dollar rate so that the yen would not again go above um, 170, which is where it had been at the peak of that crisis. And their calculations were such that unless the yen went into the 150s or the 140s, that they would make money. Of course, we know where, they, where the yen eventually went, but that was not part of their calculus at the time. And this flood of um, uh, Japanese dollars that had been earned through exports into the United States uh, had a number of interesting effects, among other things because it was possible for the United States to finance uh, deficits painlessly these def at uh, levels that had never been contemplated or thought possible before. It made, among other things, um, the tremendous defense buildup of the early 1980s um, politically feasible in the United States. Uh, that was also what, uh, not coincidentally, convinced um, first Andrew Pulf and then Gorbachev that the Soviet Union could never um, defeat the United States, could never outrate the United States in the defense race. Um, it also restructured American industry. Um, the, the combination of the very high uh, interest rates of the early 1980s plus the very high dollar, there were so many Japanese purchases of dollars that um, the yen dollar rate, the dollar was, was extremely high against the yen, meaning that whole sectors of American industry were simply taken over by their Japanese competition. Um, most of those industries were, um, you know, they were the Rust Belt industries, the employers of the, um, much of the American, uh, the American working class. So the, the, the destruction of economic security for um, much of the American working class and the restructuring of American industry away from the Rust Belt, uh, you know, the steels and all this and so forth, um, occurred that during that five-year period between 1980 and 1985. Of course, it created political backlash. And after the ideologues that dominated the U.S. Treasury in the first um, half of the Reagan administration, of the first, Reagan's first term, were replaced in the second term by, by pragmatists, they felt they had to respond to the political backlash. And what you got was the Plaza Accord. The Japanese themselves were concerned about the extent to which um, the, the, the uh, high dollar, low yen was, was causing political uh, ramifications in the states. So they agreed um, to uh, work with the United States to, um, uh, with the cover provided by uh, Germany, France, and Britain to bring down the, um, the yen dollar rate. Um, the result, of course, was beyond anyone's expectation, as these things typically are. Um, and you had a financial crisis in 1987. Um, the Japanese rode to the rescue of that financial, uh, in, in the wake of that financial crisis, and part of the means by which they rode to the rescue was the creation of Japan, the uh, bubble economy, which, and the bubble economy is very interesting because we speak of it as a, uh, we speak of it as a financial crisis, uh, and we speak of it as a, a bubble in the same way that, for example, the bubble that, 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 that popped two years ago um, in the United States is, is a bubble. But the bubble was, first of all, it was, it was a deliberate creation. The Japanese had began, I don't, I don't have enough time to go into this and, 
in any detail, but the Japanese back in the late 60s, when these contradictions first began to appear in the Japanese, they began actually to experiment um, with the controlled blowing of bubbles in part to, um, to substitute for um, what, uh, what exports had been, had been doing for the Japanese economy. That turned out, then they, they, they brought those tools out of the closet um, in, after, the, um, uh, after the Plaza Accord when the yen suddenly soared in value to compensate the Japanese industry um, for what had happened um, to their cost structure because of the soaring of the yen. Then they used the, the bubble also um, as a means of supporting um, the U.S. dollar, and very explicitly so in the, in the wake of the um, 1987 uh, stock market crash. Then the other thing that was very interesting about the bubble was that it was also deliberately punctured. Um, the Japanese elite was increasingly concerned about the social ramifications um, of the bubble, um, the fact that all kinds of people were getting rich in a way they shouldn't be, um, you know, discipline was, was, was uh, you know, the workplace was, was, was eroding and so forth. Uh, middle class families were no longer able to afford houses and so forth. And so um, the, the bubble was deliberately, the air was deliberately let out of the bubble. Um, but um, it, it got out of their, it got out of their control um, in a way that they were never able to, um, they were never able to recover from. Um, I'm beginning to run out of time, but what I wanted to, and I, and I haven't even gotten to um, what's going on right now, but um, the I wanted just to, to, to mention two things. First of all, the effect of the um, efforts by Japan to um, extricate itself from the uh, meltdown of the, of the bubble in 1991-92. The credit creation by the Bank of Japan in the mid-1990s was where the liquidity came that fueled the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98. Um, it created many bubbles in places like Bangkok. And when those, when those bubbles collapsed, um, the lessons that the rest of Asia, both the countries that were directly affected with saw governments fall, um, countries like Thailand um, and Korea and Indonesia, and the lessons that were taken by um, as you could call them bystanders, uh, very interested bystanders such as China, was that one must never be in a position where the IMF is able to dictate um, what you do. And the, re the reaction must be, we must accumulate sufficient um, uh, piles of international reserves that we never face this, this problem. So um, after 1998, what you saw was even more devotion to the economic methods that had first been premiered by the Japanese in the 1950s in order to accumulate um, large surpluses, large surpluses that were predominantly denominated in U.S. dollars, and of course found their way um, into the U.S. housing market, um, into the U.S. derivatives markets, where they had ultimately um, predictable effects. Um, the, um, the financial crisis of a year and a half ago um, had a very, very profound political effect in Japan because for the first time it demonstrated that the export-led growth model was no longer working for Japan. Um, Japanese exports, um, the, the, the quid pro quo had always been we will continue to transfer purchasing power to the United States um, through our support of the dollar and that will make sure that our factories keep running because the U.S. will buy, um, will buy Japanese goods. Now, there had been a significant uh, wrinkle introduced in the early part um, of this decade um, when Japanese capital exports to China, um, in fueling China's own investment boom, um, played a very significant role in reviving the Japanese economy, the temporary revival of the Japanese economy that we saw before the um, before the crash of, of last year, or not last year, now, but 2008. Um, and, um, but ultimately that was still uh, going to the end market of the United States. Uh, most of that production was, was, was headed for the, for the final market of the United States on the capital equipment that was being used in Chinese factories to manufacture goods that would, would go into the U.S. But um, the, the effect of, the temporary effect which at the time looked per looked uh, looked permanent um, of the of what happened in September of 2008 
was that it was revealed, it was politically revealed in ways that were no longer possible to disguise, that the way in which Japan had run its, its political economy for the preceding 50 years was no longer of any benefit to Japan. Um, and the second thing was it was obvious that the informal um, institutions of economic security that had emerged out of the uh, labor struggles of the 1950s by which uh, Japanese corporations would provide for the economic security of male heads of household, um, by which Japanese banks would keep, um, uh, would keep providing credit to companies that under ordinary circumstances or under market circumstances would have gone bankrupt. The reluctance of major companies to cut their suppliers, um, to, uh, to dump uh, traditional suppliers, um, various regulations that protected certain sectors of the economy. It was evident that what you might call these informal institutions of economic security were no longer working. Um, and then there was the usual, uh, you know, the snafus the government managed to lose large numbers of, 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 um, of, of records, of pension records. The result was what I think was the most important election in modern Japanese history, uh, which was the election of last August that brought a, uh, a new government to power. Um, and the people, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of historical amnesia um, in writing about this election that you read in the press today, because it's, it's like talking about the 1917 revolution in Russia without talking about 1905. Because these people had been in power very briefly once before, in 1993. Um, the Liberal Democratic Party was, was uh, lost its, its, its hold on parliament for a few months. Um, but um, these people didn't know what they were doing at that point. Um, and they made very serious tactical and strategic errors. But they have fought long and hard since then about what needs to be done to maintain a, a successful government. Um, and among other things, um, there, there are two, uh, the, 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 by no means a foregone conclusion that um, these people were, will be successful. Um, their opponents are, are, are many and varied and are playing very dirty. But um, there are two things that the government, um, the new government, three things really that the new government is intent on doing. One is that it is intent on fixing this political problem that has been a problem for Japan since the uh, Meiji oligarchs died off in the 1920s, which is to provide a responsible political center, one that can ride uh, herd over the bureaucracy. The second thing that they obviously plan to do is to renegotiate the terms of the U.S.-Japan relationship, which emerged, I mean, I could talk for uh, for hours about that, and, and other people could talk more authoritatively than I, but emerged out of the peculiar circumstances of the occupation, where you have this United States playing um, for Japan, uh, these functions by which a state is commonly identified. And the third thing is a renegotiation of the social compact. Um, the What you have seen in Japan growing up in recent years is the re-emergence um, of a two-class society. Um, there was at least you, you, could, you could convince yourself that maybe it was a fiction, but that there was, it gave, it gave an awfully good imitation of a single class society during the high growth years, but that is no longer true. Um, and there is a sense now that the, that the new government is trying to renegotiate the social compact. I've gone on a little bit too long, but um, I think we, we say again, the, the other, the other um, and I have to do, because this will, this will fit into yours, is that the, um, what makes it possible for the, for the Japanese government now in some ways to um, consider um, no longer acting as a primary prop for the um, American financial hegemony and renegotiating the terms of the U.S.-Japan agreement, uh, the, the terms of the U.S.-Japan relationship. What makes it possible without contemplating the destruction of the global financial system is the emergence of another country which is now playing the role that Japan has since the late 1970s of being the principal external supporter of the U.S. dollar. That country, of course, is China. With that, I will. Ho Bang Hung uh, teaches in the Department of Sociology at the University of Indiana. Uh, he's a student, he was a student of Giovanni Arrighi's. Um, his essay in the Review of uh, International Political Economy on the rise of China and the global overaccumulation crisis was a path-breaking article. Many of you will have seen his. Many of you will have seen his recent essay in New Left Review. Um, he is the editor and author of a new book called China: The Transformation of Global Capitalism, which just recently came out. 
And, uh, 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 presenting off the tank make my job easier because a lot of problems of China nowadays actually that uh, the problem in, which is very much like uh, the problem of Japan uh, in a much larger scale. Um, as uh, Tag pointed out that the China for quite a while that consciously pursue a policy that to imitate, uh, or at that time it was uh, to emulate uh, the Japan policy of promoting export and now accumulating a dollar. The, the question and the focus of my presentation is today is that now the, even the Chinese government, the Communist Party, realized that it doesn't work and it tried to shift to another model. But it has been talking about shifting from an export-oriented model to a private domestic consumption-driven <laughs> model of growth for like more than 10 years. But the, despite the talk, the, the export dependence uh, the, of China actually got worse and then the uh, consumption as a percentage of GDP of China also got worse. Um, of course, and it, it looked nice if uh, in your balance sheet you have a lot of dollars, you have a lot of uh, U.S. treasury <coughs> bonds, and actually that it is uh, where the hype about the China's uh, going to uh, rule the world comes from, that uh, China is the biggest debtor, um, creditor to, to the U.S., and then so it can dictate the terms uh, in its uh, relation with the U.S., and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, actually that uh, uh, having this uh, large among of, of uh, uh, U.S. dollar assets and treasury bonds is actually the, the more cursed than the blessing, and actually that I think the U.S. government is increasingly realize it, and then Paul Krugman has been explicitly talked about it quite for quite some time in his New York Times, uh, calling that actually China is trapped in the U.S. dollar trap. That that actually because it it is not like personal saving. It, in personal saving, you have a lot of money, more the better. But if it is uh, you are running a country as big as China, if you have a huge amount of of money, uh, U.S. dollars, then the, your question is uh, how to put the money in a safe place. And and and, uh, and the, the dilemma of China today is that it has already purchased too much of these U.S. Treasury bonds. And any move away from this market, from the perspective of the Chinese government, actually will, will cause the, the collapse uh, of the value of the bonds and then it hurt itself. And today, it's many elections in China talking about uh, 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 if China is not happy about U.S. Uh, uh, intervention into affairs related to Taiwan and Tibet, and, and uh, China can retaliate by dumping the dollars. And they are talking about dumping the dollar as if it is a kind of a cartoon character in Disney movie that they a uh, one character thumb a pie at the face of another character. So it is. It, it sounds like fun, but in the real global financial uh, market, is it, it is not working like this because when when Chinese government decide to dump the dollar. It is not just dump the dollar. It has to. It is meaning that it need to sell the dollar in exchange for something else. The question is, what is that something else? If you sell the dollar, U.S. Treasury bonds, and to buy some other asset denominated in dollars, then you are shooting your own foot because you just lead to the dis destruction of the U.S. dollars. And then if you buy something else, or uh, in U.S. measure in U.S. dollars or, or asset in U.S. dollars, and 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 it is not working. And uh, and if not, then what are you going to buy uh, after you uh, sell your, your 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 treasury bonds? So it is a big problem. And um, I don't have time to show you all the all the slides. And actually, most of the graphs you can find it in the New Left Review or in the Review in the National Political Economy article. But I'm going to show just one or two that uh, is quite new. So, uh, let me uh, see how I uh, we activate the. Projector, yeah, it is, and uh, and the similarity of China's problem, Japan problem is uh, so much so that even the, as you know, that the the, um, the symbol that denote denote the Japanese yen and the Chinese yuan is actually the same symbol. That uh, is quite ironic. And what I want to show you here is the graph. Uh, forget about all the others. Just look at the table uh, in the lower left hand corner. Let me try to enlarge it. That. Uh, Ever since the financial crisis, uh, there's a lot of talk from the Chinese government and from the, the, the think tank tribes in China talking about, oh, sorry, uh, uh, that they uh, raise a concern about the values uh, of uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, and uh, they, there's a lot of talk about uh, the possibility that they will stop buying U.S. Treasury bonds. But if you look at the data that is released by the U.S. Treasury um, about foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury bonds, um, uh, by the end of September 2008, that is right before the crisis, China and actually you have to count into Hong Kong as well because it is so separate, but actually it is the one pile of money uh, that uh, commanded by the Chinese government. 
Uh, actually, after the crisis, uh, one year afterward, actually, it increased considerably. That, uh, so on the one hand, China is talking about we are dumbing the dollars, dumbing the bonds, we are going to stop, and we are very concerned. But on the other hand, it is buying more. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the Hong Kong values, uh, the, the holding of dollar actually double. And this increase in the purchase of U.S. Treasury bonds is not only a function of the increasing supply of the Treasury bond uh, created by the U.S. during the crisis. As you can see that uh, uh, the share of uh, Hong Kong and China uh, combined uh, holdings of uh, U.S. Treasury bonds as a percentage of the global holdings that actually increased uh, uh, if you compare before and after the crisis, meaning that they, they are uh, really worried about um, the values uh, of the U.S. Treasury bonds and U.S. dollars uh, that they have already been hold, holding on to and uh, to maintain the value they have to uh, help pop up the dollars by buying more of it. So it is really a trap that it is already trapped uh, that it has no other choice than keep buying. Uh, if, of course, that uh, politically that they can also uh, risk uh, destroying its own savings by uh, dumping some of the data, but it is very risky thing that I don't think that uh, the Chinese government is going to do uh, very soon. And, and this problem, uh, the origins of the problem is that the China is too much export dependence, and that is why we thought I don't need to repeat here that is the Chinese model like the Japan model earlier is to keep exporting, and U.S. is the single most important uh, market for for the, uh, uh, trying to make product and other. And also the, the markets in other uh, Western uh, industrialized countries as well. Uh, so at the same time, China is providing the credit, uh, uh, lending money to the U.S. Uh, uh, to enable the U.S. to keep buying uh, uh, this Chinese product. So it is an export dependence and the ideology of uh, it is good to hoard a lot of data. Uh, that um, is the origins uh, of the fact that China is trapped in this China kind of trap. And uh, and the oh. Uh, uh, the graph that uh, I update from the New Left Review version of it uh, uh, is that uh, it is natural that many uh, the mainstream econ economists will talk about that, um, yeah, right, that uh, China is export dependent because it is competitive advantage. China has a huge labor, service labor in the countryside, um, the underemployed or unemployed, so uh, they have the, the, the low cost labor advantage, so why? don't pursue uh, export dependent more of uh, the development. The problem is that it is quite interesting if you contrast the China situation that uh, uh, with other earlier export dependent Asian economies, Japan and Taiwan, and the Taiwan is most interesting because a lot of things that China share, the, the mainland China share a lot of similarity with Taiwan. Um, that uh, they start with a kind of a low-cost, labor-intensive uh, mode of development and export-dependent, but after a while it is inevitable, even uh, those who start with, they have a lot of rural service labor, that uh, the labor cost will increase. Uh, but the, what is special about China is that this labor cost stays low for a very, very long time. That it is not only a function, as I argue, uh, all the times that is not only a function of the demographic size of the rural, rural labor, because if you compare it with India, that I recently started to look into that is interesting because India also has a huge rural service labor. But the problem of India is not that too much of the rural labor uh, moves to the, uh, the to the export sectors or, or, or industrial sector, but they most of them actually stay in the countryside. And they, so so you have a huge rural labor doesn't necessarily mean that this service labor or uh, 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 low cost labor can be uh, automatically go to the, the export sector. So it is a kind of a conscious policy uh, result that uh, my argument is that in the 1990s that uh, the, the Chinese government adopted a lot of uh, urban bias policy to destroy the agriculture and the rural industries in the countryside to make the life in the countryside very miserable. Uh, it included inclu the privatization of collective uh, rural industries, liberalization of grain. Uh, green uh, trade and the uh, termination of government procurement uh, of uh, of grain, so that the green price just plummet, and and so the life in countryside is very very miserable, uh, relatively, and then so it drove the, the uh, 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 peasants to become the, the urban workers in the in the coastal area uh, for whatever wage they. Uh, are offered, and it is interesting to compare with Taiwan. Taiwan in the 50s and 60s uh, also has this kind of a long-term uh, suppression of wage and then exodus of uh, rural uh, labor uh, to, to, to the export sector, but uh, 
After the 1970s, the situation changed. Not only, it is not only a demographic phenomenon, because in the 70s, you look at the uh, discussion, policy discussion of the Kuomintang regime in Taiwan, there was a huge discussion about the agricultural crisis. And uh, it was also kind of a politically very sensitive time after the communist China established relations with the U.S. and then the, the Kuomintang was very, very worried about its uh, holding of power in Taiwan. Uh, and there was an agricultural crisis. Uh, so there's a discussion about how to revive the countryside, and then uh, the result of the discussion is that the government uh, uh, adopted a lot of pro-agriculture, pro-rural policy to subsidize the farmers and peasants, and then dynamic change that uh, 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 the rural urban migration uh, slowed down relatively, and then, uh, and then the, the, the cost structures of uh, export industry change. Uh, push the, the industry in Taiwan to move on to more kind of higher value added uh, industry rather than labor intensive. Uh, in the case of China, there's a, a long term stagnation of wage as a percentage of, uh, of US wage. And so, on the one hand, it promotes export competitiveness of, uh, of the Chinese industry, but at the same time, uh, it also restrains the growth of uh, consumption power of the Chinese uh, wage earners uh, because of this uh, uh, long term stagnation of wage. And the other graph is. is, is uh, showing that uh, the wage as a percentage of the, the GDP has been dropping, uh, and in tandem is that the, the, it is the wage, and then the, actually the, the domestic consumption, private consumption, in, uh, uh, as a percentage of Chinese uh, GDP also dropping in tandem. Actually, they are simultaneous. Um, so it is why that uh, you have a policy regime that is urban biased and, and uh, discriminating against agriculture and rural area, and then you create a massive exodus of rural labor to the export sectors, and then uh, you have low cost competitiveness in the export sector, but at the same time you restrain your own ability to raise private consumption, so to, uh, to make China to ever more dependent on the U.S. and other countries' uh, uh, export uh, export market. Uh, and then when we come to the question, I um, jump in to the, um, um, to the, 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 the explanation of the persistent urban bias uh, policy regime in China. You can look at this uh, table, a very simple table, that I uh, look at the background of the members of the, the epics of the, the state power uh, in mainland China. Uh, there is the Politburo uh, in the CCP that is made up of uh, more or less 20, 20 the most elite uh, communist member. Uh, so in the 30th, uh, the, the Politburo created by the 13th Party Congress in 1987, I quote the background, uh, I quote each individual by the background. If uh, it is a guy or woman, mostly guy, that uh, had an agricultural background for his uh, career, then I quote it a uh, member with agricultural background, if that guy before uh, going up to the Politburo has a background uh, uh, governing a kind of a coastal uh, province or cities like Shanghai and Guangdong, I call it uh, as a members with a coastal background, uh, is, as you know that in, in kind of the labor politics of China, that uh, once you are you have, you was uh, in a position uh, governing Shanghai, for example, and then you build a connection, the networks with your subsidiaries and your colleagues there, and then you carry it, it become your lifelong network resources, and after you promote it to Politburo, that you, you carry this network with you, and this group of people you are acquainted with when you were in Shanghai, for example, that you continue to influence your policy and then you uh, give you some kickback or whatever. So it is the background matters. So you can see that in the 1980s, uh, in the Politburo, that there's uh, Quite a large group of uh, the members of the Politburo has an agricultural background, meaning that they either work in the agricultural ministry of agriculture or, or some uh, <coughs> uh, the rural environmental uh, 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 affairs. Uh, relatively few uh, are from coastal background. And in the 1990s, uh, you can see that the, the, the members with rural backgrounds uh, dropped drastically, and uh, uh, a large group of uh, elites coming from the coastal area, actually mostly from <coughs> Shanghai, so it is why. It, People call the late nineties is the area when that was the Shanghai gang dominated Chinese politics um, was dominant, uh, dominating Chinese politics. So it uh, literally when they make policy, they will uh, uh, cater for the interests of the coastal export oriented uh, uh, province and cities uh, more than the inland agricultural uh, 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 areas. And there was some change uh, under the current leaders. Uh, that the percentage of uh, the members in the Politburo with agricultural rural background uh, increased, but still not uh, matching the level in the 1980s. 
but the, the story is interesting is, as you can know that the current government has been, uh, since uh, 2005, has been uh, instituting some uh, policy to uh, alleviate the hardship of the peasants. For example, they abolished the agricultural tax, though the local government also uh, 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 can create a lot of uh, uh, new taxes uh, to compensate their loss because of the abolition of agricultural tax. But it is a, a progress, it is a reform. And at the same time, that uh, uh, the government also, after 2005, uh, will we regulate uh, green procurement. That uh, in the 1990s, they liberalized let the free market decide the green price, but uh, uh, under the current leadership, in 2005, they start to regulate to establish a floor of the green price. If the green price in the market falls uh, below certain level, and the government will step in to buy the green price at the kind of minimum guaranteed uh, price. So the, the result is interesting is that uh, uh, it is the updated part of my graph that uh, uh, you can see that uh, um, Right after 2005, there is a kind of a pickup of uh, the wage level in China. And there was a lot of coverage in the media, so much so that people cite the work of Arthur Lewis, uh, the, that, oh, the Lewis turning point of China has uh, finally come, that all of a sudden all rules of service labor, labor was exhausted, and then people, um, the, the, we, we no longer have service labor in the country. So it is nonsense, because you can see that it is not a demographic and market phenomenon, uh, so much so that, uh, uh, in the 1990s, that uh, the massive exodus of labor is a, a policy outcome, and the sudden hike in, in, in wage level and the sudden so-called shortage of labor from the countryside, uh, obviously, is so drastic that it cannot be a kind of lateral, smoothly happening market and demographic phenomenon. It is the policy outcome. That is, uh, the government installed a number of policies to favor rural agricultural growth, so the peasants who used to be service uh, suddenly find that life in the countryside is not that bad and then more of them decide to stay there rather than going to the coastal area. It is as simple as that. So it is the policy that matter and uh, account for this uh, sudden hike in labor cost and, and, and wage level. But the problem is that and then the financial crisis come. Now uh, there is a backlash uh, against this pro-rural and pro-agricultural pro policy that many uh, coastal exporting, uh, uh, coastal exporting uh, whereas the interests are complain complaining the, aloud about the uh, uh, doom the prospect and asking for more policy favor of the government to uh, jumpstart and support the export uh, sectors uh, at the, at many, in many uh, instances at the expense of the rural agricultural sector. So it is still not sure how it is going to play out. The one very obvious uh, 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 policy debate is about the currency. Uh, of course, the U.S. is uh, 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 keep uh, telling the government, uh, Chinese government, to uh, uh, appreciate uh, the yuan, and the Chinese government is uh, so far resisting to do it, and on two grounds. The first one is financial safety; they are reluctant to open up the, the, uh, to liberalize the capital account, uh, and for good reason, because if they let the yuan freely floating, that it will lead to a lot of hot money coming in and out, and it is kind of a financial instability. But there is another option that uh, if Chinese government really want to appreciate the, the yuan, it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to liberalize its capital account. That actually after 2005, one policy of the Hu Jintao Wen Jiabu current government has actually is to have a controlled appreciation of the yuan. So the government is still in command, but to let the yuan appreciate uh, bit by bit. Actually within China, there's two groups. It is a politics between two different interest groups. And the export sectors is against appreciation of the yuan because it hurt uh, their uh, export competitors for obvious reason, and actually there's increasing advocates uh, of control the appreciation of the yuan. Uh, the people are mostly tied to the domestic oriented industrial sectors because you can. It is very simple that, it, that if the yuan appreciate, then meaning that this uh, uh, industry can purchase raw materials and components. Many many Chinese products are get built on uh, imported components can be cheaper. And when they are selling back in the domestic market, actually they, their profit margin increase with the appreciation of the yuan. So actually there is a group, it is, it is not that China is homogeneously against the appreciation of the yuan. There is a large group of uh, domestic industry that want uh, the directed at the domestic market, want to appreciate the yuan. But again, that, uh, the, in, in, in the policy debate that uh, so far that is the export sector still gaining the upper hand because they have the networks in the product bureau and, and, and the central government. So when, uh, the central government is uh, designing what policy about uh, 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 the, the values of the yuan is concerned that uh, the export sector and 
the coastal sectors has also uh, 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 taken care of more than the domestic oriented sector. And also, if you have a controlled appreciation of the UN, also you can uh, 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 induce many export industry to move uh, to uh, the, their attention from the export market to the domestic market. So it is a kind of uh, 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 one possible outcome if there is a kind of uh, appreciation of the UN is that uh, the economy can move to a more domestic uh, demand oriented uh, um, economy, but the problem again is that uh, that uh, the the um, uh, vast interest in the coastal area and the export sector is still hijacking uh, the policy making process so much so that uh, make the central government relatively difficult to um, uh, reorient reorient the, the policies. And uh, to conclude, I would like to, to to talk about the prospect of the the so called recovery of China because. Uh, uh, it is nothing new. That uh, um, um, uh, it is a typical uh, the strategy of China to 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 weather economic external e economic crisis. In the 1990s, China became very export dependent, and in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis in 1998, uh, 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 the export market for Chinese products suddenly uh, uh, went very terrible, and then the, the Chinese government uh, the, at that time tried to weather the storm by pushing the button on the state bank to ask the state bank to just generate a lot of loans uh, to, for infrastructure pro uh, projects, to build steel mills, uh, to build highway, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it, it works at that time, as it, it's working now. Uh, but if you, you, you still remember, uh, in the year 1998, 1999, and 2000, uh, Within China and in the Western media, there's a lot of talk about the upcoming the collapse of uh, or upcoming debt crisis of China. Not external debt crisis, but internal debt crisis, because there's so many bad loans uh, in the banking sector generated by this kind of uh, the fixed asset, state-directed investment-driven recovery. Um, of course, uh, and then it is about a time when Gordon Chang uh, wrote the book uh, uh, "The Coming Collapse of China." I disagree with him on many accounts. Uh, but you need to know the historical context. The historical context is when he wrote the book that uh, the Chinese state bank and the Chinese government is uh, kind of uh, under the burden of, uh, of a huge power of loan performing loans created by uh, this uh, strategy to weather the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis through huge state direct investment. But uh, after 2000 and 2001, this crisis talk disappeared because uh, uh, the U.S. Bubble uh, accelerated its expansion uh, so that U.S. demand for Chinese uh, 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 exports uh, increased, um, and China got on the WTO and created a huge number of uh, huge amount of uh, expectation. So China export the way out of the debt crisis that many people back then predict that it was it is going to happen in the late 1990s, and because of this huge export boom after 2000, that China. Avoided that uh, that that, uh, that doom scenario that many people uh, predicted. So the people cried wolf, and the wolf didn't come at that time. At this time, people cried wolf again. Uh, I always tell uh, my kids that uh, that the, the the morals of uh, the story about crying wolf is not that. One one moral, of course, is that uh, if you cry wolf too many times, uh, nobody will believe in you. So it is just one moral. The second moral is that. After you cry, roof, the roof didn't come a number of times, even though nobody believed in you, the roof will eventually come one day. If it didn't come the third time, it will come the fourth time, it will eventually come, it is given. So it is now the situation of China, that the China, what China did in 2009 and 2008 was actually a replication of its strategy to, to, to get out, uh, to weather the global economic storms in 1997 in a much larger scale, that is uh, the, to, um, to the, Compensate the loss of profitability uh, in the export sector by asking the state bank to create a huge amount of uh, credits within the economy uh, to build a lot of uh, things that may turn out to be useless, like the high-speed rail. That, uh, that uh, but it is another story that I can go on and on for another hour to talk about. Uh, so it is. It is a. The, a lot of long performing loans is, is piling up, and according to a recent calculation, that by 2011, that the total outstanding loan, uh, private and public, uh, owned uh, 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 bought by the private and public sectors uh, in China, will be about 200 percent of uh, the GDP of China in 2009. Uh, so it is a huge amount of loan. If only 30 percent or 40 percent uh, was performing, it is a, a big problem. The problem is that 
this time around that China and, and China is still expecting that uh, the US export market and the global export market will turn around so that like in 2000 and 2001 it can export it way out of this kind of loan performing loan that prices but I don't think it is going to happen this time that as the US uh, the consumer market and the, the consumer market in Europe and other developed countries are not going to recover like in 2000 and 2001 um, so I'm uh, quite pessimistic uh, and regarding solution and, uh, to, to how to resolve it I uh, I'd, uh, probably leave it to the Q&A section and I better stop here thank you, thank you very much.